Sci science is the rigorous, ongoing scientific pursuit of experimenting and testing the validity and reliability of so called psychic or paranormal phenomena. Common psi abilities include such things as mind to mind connections, telepathy, mind over matter interactions, psychokinesis, perceiving distant places, people, objects, or events, clairvoyance, perceiving the future, precognition, prophetic dreams, deja vu, spiritual healing, the power of prayer and intention, intuition, gut feelings, and the sense of being stared at. Dean Radin wrote, There are words for psi experiences in every language, from Arabic to Zulu, Czech to Manx Gaelic. The universality of the words reflects the fact that these phenomena are basic to human experience, and indeed, psi experiences have been reported by people in all cultures, throughout history, and at all ages and education levels. A meta-analysis of every psi experiment performed and published in the English language over the past century was recently conducted by Dean Radin, senior scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Statistically analyzing the data from all 1,019 controlled studies produced the astonishing result of 1.3 times 10 to the 104th power to 1 against chance. That is 13 with over 100 zeros after it, to 1, odds against the results being due to coincidence. Dean Radin wrote, After a century of increasingly sophisticated investigations and more than a thousand controlled studies with combined odds against chance of 10 to the 104th power to 1, there is now strong evidence that some psi phenomena exist. While this is an impressive statistic, all it means is that the outcomes of these experiments are definitely not due to coincidence. We've considered other common explanations like selective reporting and variations in experimental quality, and while those factors do moderate the overall results, there can be little doubt that overall something interesting is going on. It seems increasingly likely that as physics continues to refine our understandings of the fabric of reality, a theoretical outlook for a rational explanation for psi will eventually be established. Scientists, psychologists, academic institutions, and governments have been conducting psi research with consistently positive results for over a century, yet widespread acceptance of the existence of such phenomena is curiously absent. In 2002, a review of the 57 most popular introductory psychology textbooks in common use at universities showed that 24 contained no mention of psi whatsoever, and the 33 that did devoted an average of only 2.4 pages to the subject. Not only is the voluminous amount of available psi research mysteriously absent from the textbooks, but the second most often cited references come from the magazine Skeptical Inquirer. Dean Radin wrote, This should make your hair stand up. It's like trying to sustain a serious scientific discussion based on citations from tabloids. If this is the type of scholarly information being fed to impressionable psychology students, it's not surprising that whole generations of future academic psychologists assume there's nothing to it. Alan Turing wrote, I assume that the reader is familiar with the idea of extrasensory perception, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, and psychokinesis. These disturbing phenomena seem to deny all our usual scientific ideas. How we should like to discredit them. Unfortunately, the statistical evidence is overwhelming. It is very difficult to rearrange one's ideas so as to fit these new facts in. Simply stated, there is no place in the old Newtonian, Darwinian models for the existence of psi. And this, more than anything, is likely responsible for the lack of mass acceptance of psi as a genuine phenomena. In a material universe, where mind is merely an emergent evolutionary mechanism, such abilities as clairvoyance and precognition must be cast aside as superstition or coincidence. Regardless, valid psi science continues its march forward while the skeptical establishment and its indoctrinated minions religiously defend the dogma of their crumbling material worldview. Dean Radin wrote, 
Pick up practically any scientific or scholarly journal, and you'll quickly find that researchers are always engaged in vigorous debates and controversies. The moment a discipline collapses into a single set of beliefs, constructs, or even methods, it's no longer science. It's religion. Thomas Edder wrote, When a belief is widely held in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, we call it a superstition. By that criterion, the most egregious superstition of modern times, perhaps of all time, is the scientific belief in the non-existence of psi. The term telepathy was coined in 1882 by Frederick Myers, founder of the Society for Psychical Research, during his investigation into what was formerly known as thought transference. Reports and documented cases of thought transference abound in almost every culture dating back for millennia, but during the 20th century, the scientific method was applied and repeatable experiments were performed which proved, with combined odds against chance of trillions to one, that telepathy is indeed a genuine phenomenon. The most common method of testing perceptual psi, ESP telepathy, is to isolate a test subject from a hidden target object or person placed at a distance and see if the test subject can accurately describe the target or mentally influence the other person. Hundreds of variations have been performed on experiments following this basic design. Dean Radin wrote, A classic experiment in telepathy was reported in 1923 by Dr. H.I.F.W. Brogmans and his colleagues in the Department of Psychology at the University of Groningen, the Netherlands. In this experiment, a 23-year-old physics student named Van Dam was investigated for his claimed telepathic abilities. He was placed inside a curtained booth, blindfolded, and asked to place his arm under the curtain to select one square on a 6 by 8 checkerboard placed on a table next to the curtain. The target square Van Dam was attempting to select was determined randomly by the experimenter on each trial. An assistant experimenter knew the target square and tried to mentally influence Van Dam's arm movements to guide him to select the correct target square. The results of the experiment were extremely significant, with 60 successes out of 187 trials, rather than the four expected by chance. That's associated with odds against chance of 121 trillion to 1. A second classic experiment that has withstood the test of time is the ESP card test, as popularized by J.B. Rhine's Parapsychology Laboratory at Duke University. This test involved cards imprinted with one of five symbols, circle, square, wavy lines, star, and triangle. In a typical experimental run, the deck was thoroughly shuffled, and then one person would select each card in turn and try to mentally send the symbol on that card to a distant person. This technique made it possible to collect hundreds of trials quickly in a wide variety of environments and under controlled conditions. Ryan's 1940 book, Extrasensory Perception After 60 Years, combined his 60 years of ESP research, 188 different experiments with thousands of trials, in which even the most highly controlled studies had odds against chance of 375 trillion to 1. In 1933, Hubert E. Pierce, Jr., a student of J.B. Rhines at Duke University, introduced himself, saying that he had inherited his mother's clairvoyant abilities and would be willing to scientifically test and verify his skills. For the next seven months, Rhine worked with Pierce, devising, performing, and documenting the now-famous Pierce-Pratt distance telepathy tests at his Duke parapsychology lab. The experiment consisted of 700 runs through 25-card ESP decks, with Pierce acting as the telepathic receiver while another student, Geither Pratt, was the sender. Pratt simply laid down one card per minute and concentrated on it, while Pierce, from another building on campus, attempted to telepathically read and or clairvoyantly see each card. After 1,850 trials, Pierce guessed the correct card 558 times, 32%, which is 188 times above chance expectation, 20%. Though this 12% difference may not sound like much, it is associated with odds against chance of 10 octillion to 1. Another popular and often replicated psi experiment is known as the Gans Field 
telepathy test. In a Gansfield test, participant A sits in a comfortable, reclining chair, wears headphones playing pink noise, peaceful waterfall sounds, has halved ping-pong balls placed over their eyes, and a soft red light shined on them. This type of sensory deprivation results in a dreamy state of awareness in which the subject becomes more open to mental suggestions and impressions. Once participant 1 is fully immersed in this Gansfield condition, participant 2 sits in another room watching a freeze-frame picture on a TV screen and attempts to telepathically send that image to participant 1. Later, participant 1 comes out of the Gansfield state, discusses their impressions, is shown four images, and must choose which one they think Participant 2 was sending them. Dean Radin wrote, From 1974 through 2004, a total of 88 Gansfield experiments, reporting 1,008 hits in 3,145 trials, were conducted. The combined hit rate was 32%, as compared to the chance expected 25%. This 7% above chance effect is associated with odds against chance of 29 quintillion to 1. The modern Gansfield experiment is as close to the perfect psi experiment as anyone knows how to conduct. Until recently, the Gansfield experiments were largely unknown outside of the discipline of parapsychology. Then, in 1994, psychologists Daryl Bem from Cornell University and Charles Onerton from the University of Edinburgh, published a meta-analysis of Gansfield studies in Psychological Bulletin, a well-regarded academic psychology journal. That paper provided strong evidence for a genuine psi effect. Bem and Onerton's review of earlier Gansfield studies estimated an effect with overall odds against chance of 48 billion to 1. In Upton Sinclair's 1930 book Mental Radio, he catalogued a series of picture-drawing telepathy experiments performed in collaboration with his ESP-gifted wife, Mary Craig Sinclair. During these tests, Upton or friends and family would sketch a small object, and then Mary, in another room, another house, or even miles away, would mentally perceive the image and reproduce the sketch herself. Mental Radio contains scores of these sketches which show incredible similarities far beyond what anyone would expect by chance. In conclusion to these experiments, Upton Sinclair wrote, There isn't a thing in the world that leads me to write this book except the conviction which has been forced upon me that telepathy is real, and that loyalty to the nature of the universe makes it necessary for me to say so. It is foolish to be convinced without evidence, but it is equally foolish to refuse to be convinced by real evidence. A second example of picture-drawing experiments is described in the book Mind to Mind, published in 1948 by French researcher René Warcollier. Warcollier was already convinced that telepathy existed through the work of Rhine and others, so his books primarily explored how it worked. He noted that images were not transmitted like photographs, but were scrambled, broken up into component elements, which are often transmuted into a new pattern. What War Collier demonstrated is compatible with what modern cognitive neuroscience has learned about how visual images are constructed by the brain. It implies that telepathic perceptions bubble up into awareness from the unconscious and are probably processed in the brain in the same way that we generate images in dreams. And thus, telepathic images are far less certain than sensory-driven images and subject to distortion. A third picture-drawing experiment was conducted in 1941 at Cambridge University by psychologist Watley Carrington. He recruited 250 students to attempt to replicate sketches in a series of five experiments, with ten drawings each for a total of 50 targets. By the end of the study, Carrington had collected 2,200 student sketches, which he then cross-matched with the original 50 possible targets. Amazingly, he found 1,209 drawings, 55%, were similar to the targets. And this is from 250 different students with no particular ESP gifts or previous experience. Another telepathy test that has been scientifically investigated for nearly a century is the sense of being stared at. In a typical study of this sort, participant 1 stands with his back turned to participant 2, who stands a few meters behind him. Next. 
Participant 2 flips a coin to decide whether he will stare at the back of Participant 1's head for 10 seconds, or look away for 10 seconds. After the 10 seconds pass, Participant 1 records their impression, yes or no, and the coin is flipped again for the next trial. Dean Radin wrote, British biologist Rupert Sheldrake has popularized experiments based on this simple design, and under more controlled conditions, such as those involving use of blindfolds, no trial-by-trial -trial feedback, and even more secure conditions such as having participants stare through a window from a distance, I found 60 such experiments involving a total of 33,357 trials from publications cited by Sheldrake and others. The overall success rate in these experiments was 54.5%, where chance expectation is 50%. The overall odds against chance are a staggering 202 octodecillion. That's 202 with 56 zeros after it to 1. In over a dozen scientific experiments over the last 45 years, using EEG and MRI brain scanning technology, pairs of identical twins have been separated into different rooms, and one of them subjected to visual or emotional stimulus, which is then found to register on both of their brains simultaneously. This has also been shown to happen with a lower correlation rate between family, friends, and complete strangers as well. Dean Radin wrote, The design used in these electroencephalograph or EEG correlation experiments asks, in effect, whether poking one person will provide an ouch response in a distant partner. It's not recommended to poke people in the brain, so instead we use a stimulus like a flashing light to cause one of the brains to jump electrically in a predictable way and then we look at the other distant brain to see if it's jumping at the same time. Psychophysiologist Jacobo Grinberg Zilberbaum and his colleagues from the National Autonomous University of Mexico reported a series of studies in which they claimed to detect simultaneous brain responses in the EEGs of separated pairs of people. One of their studies was published in the journal Physics Essays, stimulating another round of replication attempts. In 2003, a successful replication was reported in neuroscience letters by EEG specialist Jerry Wackerman and his colleagues. Wackerman's team concluded that we are facing a phenomenon which is neither easy to dismiss as a methodological failure or a technical artifact, nor understood as to its nature. No biophysical mechanism is presently known that could be responsible for the observed correlations between EEGs of two separated subjects. Another successful replication, this time reported by Liana Standish of Bastyr University and her colleagues, was recently reported in the medical journal Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine. They conducted an EEG correlation experiment with the receiving participant located in a functional magnetic resonance imaging fMRI, scanner. They found a highly significant increase in brain activity, odds against chance of 14,000 to 1, in the receiving person's visual cortex in the back of the brain, while the distant partner was viewing a flickering light. The same group later successfully replicated this finding. The man who invented the EEG, Hans Berger, actually became interested in the brain and the powers of the human psyche after a telepathic experience he had in early childhood. It began when one day, as a soldier during a military training exercise, he was thrown off his horse and nearly trampled by a horse-drawn cannon. Dean Radin wrote, Miraculously, the driver of the artillery battery managed to stop the horses just in time. The accident left hands thoroughly shaken, but without serious injury. At that very moment, many miles away in his family's home, Han's older sister was suddenly overwhelmed with an ominous certainty that something bad had happened to Hans. She anxiously insisted that their father contact him, and so he did via telegram. That evening, when Hans received the telegram, he was initially concerned as he had never before received a telegram from his father. Then, upon reading his sister's urgent concern about his well-being, he knew that his feelings of intense fear earlier in the day had somehow reached his sister. Many years later, Hans wrote, This is a case of spontaneous telepathy in which, at a time of mortal danger, and as I contemplated certain death, I transmitted my thoughts, while my sister, who was particularly close to me, acted as the receiver. French philosopher and Nobel laureate Henry Bergson, in a presidential address 
to the Society for Psychical Research in London, May 1913, said, If telepathy is a real fact, it is very possible that it is operating at every moment and everywhere, but with too little intensity to be noticed, or else it is operating in the presence of obstacles which neutralize the effect at the same moment that it manifests itself. We produce electricity at every moment. The atmosphere is continually electrified. We move among magnetic currents, yet millions of human beings lived for thousands of years without having suspected the existence of electricity. It may be the same with telepathy.